I'm Ece Özdemiroğlu. I'm Sabina Apet. And I'm Jill Duggan. Welcome to season two of Join the Dots. We've spent our careers giving advice on the environment and learned that choices are never straightforward. But working through the complexity is rewarding. Here in each episode, we explore the issues surrounding an everyday choice to help you decide what's best for your health, wallet and our planet. You can find more information about this and other episodes on our website, jointhedotspodcast.com. And we'd love to hear from you on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Hello, everyone. By way of introduction to our guests in this episode, let me say a few words about why we are doing this podcast. There are two key reasons. First, we want our listeners to hear and share our wonder when we're faced with the complexity of nature. Our wonder, not our fear. We're pragmatic. We're driven by what we all can do to make things better. But we don't think problems can be solved by just buy this, do that, and it'll all be fine attitude. The lasting solutions come from a more respectful approach to nature and a more mindful study of our relationship with it. This is a way of working, whatever we do, and we select our guests from amongst people who work like this. Second is that no matter how respectfully the work is done, the evidence and the facts we collect are just not enough to change hearts, minds and behaviours. We need to tell stories, we need to engage with people, with each other at an emotional level too. And that's why, for example, we spoke to Susan Gaines, a novelist, and Angie Penarenas, a theatre maker, in previous episodes. And that's also why we have Harriet Fraser, a writer, and Rob Fraser, a photographer, with us in this episode. Together, they are somewhere nowhere. Welcome, Harriet. Welcome, Rob. Hi, Eche. It's really nice to see you again. Thanks for inviting us to take part. Yes, good morning. Good morning. So I want to start with the name. I love the name of your partnership, your collective. I don't know what you call it. Uh, Tell us. I can't express why I love it, but perhaps because it describes exactly where I feel I am most of the time, somewhere, nowhere. Was that the intention? And why the name? What do you do? And then we'll delve more into how and why you do it. That's funny that you feel you are exactly somewhere, nowhere. We love that. Actually, the name comes from the first line of a poem that inspired me when I was about 14 and I had quite a lot of really dull English teachers and it really wasn't doing it for me. And then I read this poem by a woman called Anne Stevenson and the opening line is somewhere, nowhere in Utah. And for 20 years, I didn't remember the whole poem, but I always remembered that line. And it gave me this feeling of openness and possibility and potential and When you get to know a place, it's not nowhere anymore, is it? It's somewhere. And so that that became our name. And we contacted Anne and said we wanted to use it. And uh, then we went to meet her and we kind of had this ongoing relationship, which was really nice. But it, yeah, it means things on different levels, doesn't it? Yeah, as Harriet said, we were very fortunate to meet her. Even though she was English, I believe, uh, she spent a lot of her time in America Uh, but came back to England to teach at Durham in the latter years. And we contacted her and asked her if if she'd mind if we'd use that name as part of our collective, our collaboration. And she said no. Uh, And we went to interview her. She said no. She said yes. She she said no, mind. (laughs) She wouldn't mind. She wouldn't mind. So we went to see her and had a a cup of tea and some cake with her uh, and spent three hours. And she read the poem on on audio for us, The Somewhere Nowhere in Utah. And it was quite an emotional moment to hear her read that poem um, that rolled back the years for you, I'm guessing, mm. Harriet. And, and and was very mindful of the environment. And somehow, I think even when I was 14, something landed with me about that connection to place and, and the enormity of great big landscapes, but then the importance of the small things. Something happened, and I think... That's also, yeah, what's behind our practice. So to reel back a bit and say what it is that we do, I'm a writer and a poet, and Rob's a photographer and a filmmaker, and we've been working together since 2011 as Somewhere Nowhere, and practice has developed 
really to, it still has writing and photography at its core, but it's developed beyond that. And through our artwork, we do installations, but we also get out and about in the different landscapes a lot and often with other people to really continue asking questions about how we as a species relate to the places around us, depending on who we are, what our background is, what our livelihood is, and and what our value systems are. Yeah, I think talking about demystifying expertise, we, we love talking to people who know their stuff, whatever role they play, whatever part they play, generally around the environment. So we'll make a beeline for people who think know something that can help inform our jigsaw, you know, put another piece of the puzzle into the place setting of how we're trying to understand landscape. So we, we really enjoy talking to experts. We may not understand all that they say. Uh, that's quite commonplace. But I think in a way for us to hear it and then disentangle it in our own minds, it allows us to put another piece in that place together. But I think overall, I think the, the biggest thing for us in, in our practice is actually being outside, getting out there, collecting, as we call it, data of the heart. You know, you hear a lot of experts talking about place and in some senses it's abstract, understanding what's going out in that world, but to, to actually get a feeling of a place, feel the weather in your face, feel the wind, feel the rain, see the trees move, get all that data. I think that enriches our understanding of what we're grappling with, which is how to better serve the environment of course that we're part of so so that's what we do through our work but having that information being thrown at us from all sorts of different angles is a good way of sort of bringing it all together as well i don't think experts understand each other or themselves either so it's not it's not a not expert non-expert divide i mean we just don't understand i think the more you work in something the more you realize how little you know isn't it in every field so how do you i mean you said you engage with with the experts and you ask them you learn from them and then but what what do you produce how can we see what you produce how can one be part of your collective even if it's as a can i use the term consumer of what you do we've got a website uh, somewhere dash nowhere.com uh, which we put a lot of our work out through we've just changed service so we're adding adding to that historically we'll create small books or larger books of the projects that we've delved into historically we also produce exhibitions largely wherever we can on the back of the projects that we produce and that's quite a small scale way of getting things out to a very low amount of people but we also produce articles for publication we'll do things like this you know there's many ways of getting your message out whatever your message is we're putting out information in in, in a wide variety of forms and it's there to be taken in a wide variety of forms and of course we can't ignore things like social media these days love it or loathe it it's a way of engaging in conversations through twitter through instagram and through facebook Uh, you know they're all there to be to be used and uh, we formed quite a useful community through those three. Yeah, I think um, what we really try to do with our work is to be part of and help to grow conversations. So we often, we, we work within research teams or within collaborations and part of the work we do is conversational. And I think sometimes people expect art to be a thing that you can touch and see and maybe you can buy it, maybe you can take it away. But art is often about the process and and what happens between people. And I think that what we find and the way people reflect back to us is sometimes the work that we do just nudges somebody to listen in a slightly different way. And that might be to themselves or to somebody else in their field or somebody who, who brings an entirely different perspective or even to the natural world. And and it's it's nice what you say about experts, Sege, that you know, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. But also that word expert, I think sometimes it's taken to mean somebody who who might wear a suit or might have a really high salary or might have done a degree or a PhD or whatever. But a lot of the real experts that we meet, farmers who are the biggest experts of the land that they work in and with every single day. But sometimes they're not called experts. So it's it's a word that really means kind of somebody who knows their stuff by experience. And, and the more passion that comes into that, the more heartfelt 
attachment to whatever it is somebody is an expert in, I think the more we become affected. It's not just about the information. It's not just what you put in your head. It's what you feel. That kind of chimes with us, I think, because that's why we wanted to do the sort of demystifying expertise series to almost to bring the experts down from the plinths, because doing that misses the people who don't conform to how an expert should look and behave and where they their journey. But also it's too much pressure on experts to find the answer because we're always looking for the answer. Whereas I think it seems to me that you're kind of pulling back a little bit and to have a wider angle lens, if I can throw in a photographic term in, rather than really focus on we've got this just one this one problem that we must find this one solution and forgetting about the the connections between things do you are you trying to find those connections yeah you kind of hit the nail on the head and it's I think it's quite easy if you say oh well let's let's do an art project about I don't know squirrels or hay meadows or something and you have a very specific conversation around that a very specific outcome and that's quite an easy win but you miss the connections and what we tend to do and and increasingly so is follow we're always led by curiosity and follow the connections between things and not shy away from complexity and there isn't one single answer to anything and and so to kind of imagine that there is and to set off on a quest to get the ultimate answer is just to just to be in continual frustration and, and perhaps even to simplify things and cause ha- more harm than good. So that project we did a couple of years ago called Sense of Here, we thought, well, what's my here? What's what's your here? Where do they overlap? Whose perspective is it in any one place? And we certainly didn't take ourselves towards a single answer, did we, Rob? It just spanned out and complexity is a very real thing and the conversations that arise when you bring that onto the table are quite interesting. Yeah, we work with Sense of Ear with uh, a team from Lancaster University called Ensemble, a five-year fellowship program. Professor Gordon Blair was running it and he said something quite interesting that you look at things through a hundred different lenses. You can't just look at it through a single lens really and come up with a solution. You need to embrace complexity. I know that's not helpful sometimes. I know it's not useful and I know it's difficult to grapple, but things that we're grappling with in terms of climate change and biodiversity loss amongst many other things are complex. They're not simple, but that doesn't mean that you can't still look at the nuances. You can't still probe around a bit to at least find a way forward, given all the information that is out there, to try and help try and come up with something. So through our work, we we hope that by talking to a lot of different people, who perhaps have different valuing systems, at least allows us to to hear from from people. There's certain people we won't bother talking to. They're so far off the radar in terms of what they need to be said. I think that those kind of people, those kind of voices are really unhelpful. But but still within that, there are multiple truths about what's happening out in a landscape. So it's it's by doing that. And and talking about expertise, I think in organizations, what tends to happen, in my mind, I might be wrong, is that the more expert people get, the further up the the chain they come and the, and the further away from the ground they become. So they're less attached to a space, to a place, to the simple things, to the small elements that make up a complex landscape. They're making big, broad decisions, but they lose that sight of the wonder, the joy, perhaps, or I don't know. So maybe it's time to shake things up a little bit get those people at the top closer to the ground. Yeah, and what you say about the context of this podcast, Serge, is um, about looking at, we kind of know as, as a society and as a species what we need to do and what's gone wrong, but somehow the actions aren't following and we can't just blame the policymakers and the leaders. Every aspect of the way we live somehow why are the actions not following the knowledge that we have and so taking that that approach of 101 lenses or listening to different points of view and then trying to make connections between them i don't know if it makes a difference but for some people that begins new conversations or just sparks a new idea of what can be done practically to make a small change maybe we hope you talked about looking at a place through different lenses and how do you do that when you've got one camera 
because uh, the reason I'm asking this because I know you go into the same place every year or, or quite often. Yes, through our work, we like to repeatedly visit certain places just to keep an eye on what's going on there. We did a project back in 2015 to 2017 called the Long View. We selected over a period of time seven lone trees spread across. Cumbria in an arc, a constellation of trees, we call them, seven trees of different species. Six were in the Lake District National Park and one was further to the east in now what's called the Westmoreland Dales. And over the two-year period, we visited these trees many times, uh, night and day during winter, summer, spring and autumn. And they became these fixed focal points in a landscape, allowed us to go and sit in that space with the trees, focus on the trees, sort of be with it during all these different seasons, all these different weathers to get a feel for the space. But then, as always with our work, increasingly it's become, is to consider all the elements that make up that place. You know, what's going on there? You know, the trees here, the trees, this fixed anchor, if you like, in the space. But by then starting to delve deeper into the space, we knew the farmers that farmed in each of the landscapes. We had conversations with them. We talked to many different experts about trees, about landscape, about soil, about policy making, but always through the excuse of these seven trees. And I think in some ways that that got to the heart of what our practice is always about, which is pausing, sitting still, allowing the landscape to come to us rather than us going to the landscape, if that makes sense. That might sound a bit strange, but by just sitting still and listening, I think it's a form of meditation for Harriet. I won't speak for her, but I'm sure she'll say that by by just allowing the the space to talk to her a bit. But for me, as a photographer, it allowed me to collect these portraits of these trees in, in different seasons, if you like, but still have that as the anchor point. I was fixated by these objects, these these sentient beings in the landscape, and you know, I couldn't almost take my camera off them for the periods of time of there, whereas Harriet could perhaps wander away a little bit and go further up valley and just take in a bit more. But I became focused, yeah, an addict, if you like, in a way, to get the image I thought would say something about this visit this time. It was beautiful. It was a really powerful project for us, I think. Yeah, I think that revisiting those same trees again and again and again the familiarity that that we got with the space, but also seeing them change. And then Rob was able to show that through his photographs. I think often we see something <clears> in the landscape and, and it's great, you take a picture and that becomes your abiding memory. But when you revisit and revisit and revisit, there's no single abiding memory. It's all in flux. It's all changing. There's that twinning there of it's constant and yet it's changing. And for me, revisiting again and again is a really interesting process as a poet because after several months, yeah, okay, I might know this place pretty well, but that act of really slowing down allows the words to come to me from the act of being there with that tree or that river. As a poet, yeah, to, to just be able to sit with a tree and that act of very deeply slowing down allows words to come to me that I might be surprised by, which is quite a nice process rather than laboring it intellectually. And I, I enjoy that about the creative process when it's, it's something comes and that's from the act of being outside and being very still and also subconsciously having learnt from talking to other people who've helped me know what's going on at a much deeper level. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add, actually, is the idea of, uh, in our talks that we give, you know, we give talks to various people throughout the course of our work, and there's one slide that be has become a constant in a way that, that shows these three words, curiosity, relationships, and time. And we think by... The curiosity is the biggest tool that we've both got. You know, I've got cameras and Harriet's got pens and paper, but we still think to be curious in the first instance is the greatest tool we can have, possibly as a human being. Relationships are those relationships we build up with people over a long period of time. We know farmers in particular over 10 years now and have, have good friends with a lot of them, and we know them. We can stitch the landscape of, the, of Cumbria in particular through our relationship to who's over in the next valley, who's over in the hill over there. We know who's doing what at what time of the year. So that's really important to us. And time, we don't like to rush at projects generally. We, we think that 
in order to do a project, and I'm doing the inverted comma, flying inverted comma symbol now, in order to do a project, you need to sit with it. It can't be a rush, rush thing. or it, you know, Sometimes it has to be because of funding, budgets and timescales. But in order to soak yourself in a place or a subject, I think you need to uh, give yourself the gift of time to let it wash over you and understand more and hear more. As Harriet said earlier, you don't come up with any quick solutions. In fact, sometimes you don't come up with any solutions, but it's just that listening, just that letting a subject or a, a series of interrelated subjects wash over you, I think are really helpful. But you know what you say there about time, Rob, you, we also need patience because I think uh, we definitely feel that there's an urgency to the threat of of change and how things are changing and this frustration sometimes that, oh my goodness, we haven't got long to do anything. But it's still really important to be able to be slow and to breathe. And sometimes 10 minutes can be an awfully long time or a day might be a really long time, even though you think a year goes really quickly. So we we kind of play with that tension between slowness and urgency. I think that's always, always there for us. Mm, definitely. <laughs> well, I guess even from pragmatic point, we are being told we don't have enough time. But if you rush to a solution and turns out to be the wrong one, that's the biggest loss of time, right? So, and I think in economics that I've learned over the years, the most important step in an, in an economic project is to scope it. Because to, to do it quickly, to do it cheaply, to, to do it focused on finding a solution or justifying a solution, you could draw a scope that's just so narrow that, you get to the result you want, but it is it will be wrong. It'll have un what is it called? Un unintended consequences. They are kind of sometimes willfully ignored consequences that you hope to God that won't happen. But it will happen because you left them out of your thinking. And I think maybe that's what that's the kind of what I'm trying to see how I can benefit from your work in my work. I guess that's my next next question that it strikes me as that thinking more mindfully, more broadly about what I'm doing at the start is is the key for me. I wanted to take you to another project of yours, which is about trees. And you mentioned trees already with trees and HS2. And the reason I want to pick that, if that's all right, is because you live in Cumbria. I normally live in London, but I went through on the west coast train through Cumbria yesterday and so all the it was a beautiful day so it's lots of lovely hills and trees and a bit of the sea some uh, past Preston and so I'm, I I thought about your HS2 project and then I will come back if you tell us a little bit about that why you did it how you did it and then I'll tell you a little bit about cost benefit analysis after that back in I think 2015 16 17 we got involved with the Woodland Trust and the creation of a new tree charter for the UK and I was the poet in residence with them and again you know through that relationship we started talking to them about ancient woods and we asked them about the woods that were being affected by the route of HS2. And we went to visit some of them with them, thinking about what we could do and how we could use art to highlight what was happening there. And we ended up getting to know a particular woodland called Glyn Davis Wood, which is where is it? The Warwickshire? It's right on the right. border between Warwickshire and Northamptonshire. Mm. Uh, one of the trees, an, an ancient oak, 300 years plus, is a boundary tree, a boundary marker of the, the two counties. Sadly, it now sits the wrong side of a wire fence. It's a tree that's due to be axed along with possibly a quarter of the woodlands, I'd say, maybe even a third of the woodlands. It's got this fence going through the middle of the woodlands and it's it's an extraordinary place having spent uh, quite a lot of time there on our own with members of the Banbury Ornithological Society who own the woods and the Woodland Trust so we're hearing once again people who are experts in birds and trees and place having spent so much time in a place like that and, and got to know it reasonably well you can't help but be saddened by the act of, of removal, desecration in some senses of, of this woodland. It's just an extraordinary vibrant place that's due to have this wrench cut all the way through it. But to get back to what we did, we spent three days in the woods in 
2019, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, well, it's one of 108 woodlands that are due to be, ancient woodlands that are due to be <clears throat> negatively impacted by HS2. Some but, of those are completely destroyed. Some of those are just impacted or partially destroyed. That was the old numbers, as I understand it, because one of the arms of HS2 is probably been put on the backbone or maybe even stopped now, the bit that goes from Manchester to Leeds, a few of those uh, woodlands will not obviously be affected mm. now. But at, at the time it was 108 and, yeah. uh, and we were asked to develop some kind of an art intervention that looked at this problem. And we used some yellow cloth that we had used in a previous art installation. We cut it up and we wrapped 108 trees. There was a team, we got a team involved, we wrapped 108 trees in this yellow cloth and created a series of poems and then did a series of walks through the woods with the poems as as kind of stopping points and yeah there were tears it was very very emotional wasn't yeah it? it was it was very emotional we had people from the woodland trust there we did a separate walkthrough with members of the ornithological society who owned the woods and then we did a one small walkthrough with some members of the public who, who got in touch and then they were taken from a local rail station and, and delivered, if you like, to the site to spend three hours with us in the woods. As Harriet said, it was really emotional, actually. It was a beautiful day. The woods were in full bird song and light was coming through the trees. It was just gorgeous. And it was, it felt so saddening to think that what we were looking at was going to have this um, scar placed through it. And, I, and I, that's not to decry progress. You know, I think we, we can't stay static. We can't place everything in aspic, but I think given the parlous state of uh, ancient woodlands, how poor they're served, we're down to 2% and, and lessening, I think, now in terms of the, the woodlands we used to have. So they're very fragmented, and of course, the more that we cut through them, the more fragmented those habitats become, the the less ancient woodland we have. Ancient woodland is a, is a definition, by the way. It's, it's woodland that's been in place or untouched is it 200 years 400, 400 years. years it's been marked on a map for that long but of course some of them have been there for a lot longer but you know doing that work is looking more at art as activism or there's, there's a word that an artist friend of ours Edwina Fitzpatrick used that's really stuck with us which is artists as activators and if we can use our work <coughs> to activate other people that feels like it's doing something. And in that particular case, it did activate a lot of people. It didn't stop HS2. But as with anything else, there's never one answer. There's a lot of different actions that need to happen to keep the pressure on protecting what really does need protection. I think both of us feel frustrated that things aren't moving in the right directions or seemingly aren't moving in the right direction. Uh, and I fear that there's a lot of greenwashing going on. There's a lot of people who are saying um, saying one thing but still carrying on business as usual. And I, and I feel really saddened that future generations are not going to be able to feel the dappled light of an ancient woodland or hear the sound of a curlew or so many other things that are going to slide out the way. You know, we've already lost a lot, a heck of a lot of our biodiversity in this country. It, it shouldn't be extraordinary to hear the sound of a curlew. It, it should not be, but it is. It's remarkable. But he, just by default, there are not enough good people aren't not doing enough proper work on the ground and, and perhaps in some sense is speeding up. If we don't do it now, it's going to be harder further down the line. It may be expensive to do it now, but I think it'd be much more expensive to do things later. Or we don't bother. We've got choices. We don't so, bother. So how do you translate that from an economic perspective when you're talking about cost benefit analysis? We have heard somebody put put a price on a curlew, which is a very difficult thing for us to swallow. But what is it from your perspective, Eche? Yeah, it's not putting a price, I think, but it's helping us to compare what Rob touched upon. You know, you said we don't, you don't want to stop progress. You don't want to, to preserve everything as they are now. So there are, there are choices to be made, right? So there are trade, well, economists talk about trade-offs. So there's no free lunch. You want to do one thing, you're going to have to give up something else. What we are trying to do is to make that comparison, in a way, if I can say, more fair. 
because the only thing that gets more attention and therefore is thought to be more important are the things that can be quantified and, dare I say, monetized. Because things like HS2 are driven on the basis of the value of time people will save traveling. And value of time is valued in terms of how productive they can be because we know how to measure that in monetary terms. Compare that with people's enjoyment of forests, natural world, hearing the curlew song or any other song. There is an imbalance of information. I'm not saying an imbalance of importance. It might be that things we can't measure are more important. And this is what motivates me. Can we find a way of expressing all these things, all the pros and cons of a decision or most of the pros and cons of a decision in similar terms so that they're not ignored, so that a decision maker who sits in treasury or in a boardroom who says, yeah, that's nice, but they can just go somewhere else to listen to Curlew. I need to get these people from A to B as quickly as possible because that's where the progress, that's where the value is. What I want to be able to show is that actually the value of the time you save may be less than the value you lose from not being able to be in nature like that or not having enough of forest, enough of nature around us. For many of the services nature provides us, but also just for sheer beauty and the need of humanity for nature. And that's why we're trying to value. We don't put a price on curlew. It's not so that we can buy and sell curlews like we buy and sell loaves of bread or train tickets, but so that it's just an expression of like how much people are willing to give up something else to be in that forest. It's a bit convoluted, sometimes hard to explain, but it's really not for people like you or other people who appreciate nature. It's pe for people who don't appreciate it as much. It's, listening to you makes me think about modelling as well and how models are often relied on for making decisions but they're only as good as the data that's put in them. And while the actual measurement might not be the same, you might have a liter or a ton or whatever, a, a unit of time. If you don't even put it into your thinking model, it's not going to come out in the decisions that you make. It comes back to that saying for me about the knowing the cost of everything, but the value of nothing in a way. And I, and I think sometimes the wrong people are asked about value uh, and, and cost and once these objects in our landscape, and I call them objects, I know that sounds a bit um, cold, but these things, and these things can be habitats, can be spaces, once they're lost, they ain't going to come back. And it's it's no good, you know, we should be starting to save these things now rather than trying to save the last of, because then we know uh, for a fact it's too late. We keep coming back to curlews because we spent a lot of time looking at curlews a couple of years ago, and we're really, really in touch with them now we're talking to experts right across the field who who know their stuff again about curlews and that comes down to to farmers as well as people who are involved in the conservation side of things and if you've never heard a curlew actually i don't know if you've heard a curlew but they their sound in spring when they first arrived here in the uplands around our house is haunting it's extraordinary we're probably down to six or seven pairs in our locale and probably fields in historically would have been full of them going back in time we know that for a fact in fact, we got a farmer phone us up last night on his mobile phone. He was cutting his field and a curlew burst out of the grass in front of him and he stopped and there was a, a nest with eggs right in front of him. So he stopped immediately, came away, came out of the field and just left the rest of the grass. Now that's a decision that farmer we know quite well made. He made the call to not just mow around it and then get the rest of the grass in and disturb the birds more. He made a conscious decision to just come away from that field and forego the rest of the grass just because he didn't want to disturb those birds. And, and before that, he'd made a conscious or a subconscious decision not to go too fast. So what you say about time and costing time and this idea that we save time, coming back to art, but just a way of thinking, I don't think that a lot of us spend enough time or enough of our time just being slow. And the if you did a cost-benefit analysis on going slow or going fast, I wonder what that would look like. Because sometimes when you take time out to be slow or to do nothing, you're far more productive. 
in the time when you're actually doing something. I think that's often undervalued. Yeah, and you said earlier on about speed of decision making and urgency, Eche, and I think sometimes the quickest decisions are made by slow ways of doing to get to a decision quickly. You can step back, look all around it, talk to people right across the board, take in what they say, look at all the evidence and then make a decision. Well, I want to share yesterday morning I was walking with a friend in our local park in London, which was something we did weekly during the lockdowns. And of course, now we're both or oh, she's more back in the office and we can't do it as much, and which I feel is a loss and walk into her through the same path in the park yesterday morning, I realized I was walking faster. And then I remembered like in a kind of montage in a film, all the times that I walked towards her early morning during the lockdown and how I made a conscious effort to observe how the trees and the floor and like one day it was mulchy, muddy, one day it was frosty hard. That kind of observation that I went through just walking less than 10 minutes to, to get to where we meet. And yesterday, my head was full of things, uh, other things. I was still walking the same path, but I wasn't really there. I was nowhere. You mentioned a few of your past projects, and, and I know one of them. We You came and you spoke to us, uh, economists, talking about valuation. So you said you talked to a lot of experts and you learned from them and you, you share with them your work. And, and I know that because you came to our annual environmental economics conference and you heard a lot about these valuation stuff and cost benefit analysis and many more that nobody should really be subjected to. Anyway, never mind. and that was 2020, two days before the lockdown in, in March. And you spent the day with us, you did your installations, and you also ended the day with a poem, Harriet, and we have a film of it. And I, it's still up on our network's site, so I will link it in the show notes. Beautiful film with Rob's photographs and your words. But can you tell us a little bit about what you're working at the moment? Okay, we're working on a few things actually at the moment. Um, just talking about data and modeling, we've, we had a chance to work on a project around natural flood management and how land use changes by land managers and farmers can have a positive effect to reduce flooding in towns and cities. And so we've been talking to modelers, but also walking through farms to see where the earth's really sticky and finding out how farmers understand the way the soil behaves and how that impacts water. But really what, and what I've done is produce a set of poems off the back of that, weaving in the experience of people who've been flooded or people who have land to manage or people who have models to grapple with. And that's been very interesting. Yeah, so. that's well off our patch. That's down in the Thames Valley catchment area. So that's working with Reading University. They invited us in there, Joanne Clark, the the PI on the project, because she wanted to bring a different lens to, to what was happening. You've got a wide variety of disciplines who are talking or not talking in some cases about what their experiences are. So she wanted us to come in to, to have a panoplic overview about what was going on to try and bring to bear what we did. So we spent a lot of time in the Thames Valley area uh, and doing what we do is to actually collect, as I said at the beginning, the data of the heart. We spent four days walking along the Thames path to because that's where everything flows into it. felt like a nice metaphor in a way to spend time in that landscape. So that's coming to a close week after next. We're presenting at an organization called FarmEd in Oxfordshire when the, the kind of the project's being wrapped up. So another project we're working on is working on peat bog in northern Cumbria. It's a mire or a moss as it's known locally. It's a national nature reserve now, but previously for 60 years up until 2012, it was used for peat extraction, uh, largely for the horticultural industry. 480 hectares, so it's a huge site. So it's now going through a process of being turned into a, a nature reserve, but also for the peat to be restored. So we're working with the Place Collective, an organisation that Harriet and I set up about a year and a half ago, bringing environmental artists together as a community. We're all about community. So our community, if you like, is environmental artists, people who are researching their own particular field about how they use their art form to relate to space, place, and the culture of land use. So five place collective artists are working with the University of Cumbria and Natural England to look at what's happening in that place, to, to better inform, that sounds a bit nasty, but to 
better inform the local community about what is happening on their doorstep. Previously, it gave work to 80 people, but now it's it's given over to nature, if you like, uh, and leisure use and carbon storage, which has become the big zeitgeist at the moment. So that's an interesting project to be working on. And finally, we're working on a project looking at common land in four different areas across England, in Lake District National Park, Yorkshire Dales, Dartmoor and the Shropshire Hills. Once again, talking to a wide variety of people from graziers to conservationists to land managers to who else? we talking to in terms of that project? Well, anybody who has a, a connection or an investment in, in Upland Commons, and it may be people that are working out how to evaluate carbon storage or plant trees or rear healthy sheep. So we're working on that for a year to, to gather together the different voices. And again, it is complicated, but if we spend time bringing different voices into the same space, then it's possible through the presentation of that work to see the connections between them and and perhaps the common ground, which is kind of what we hope. But along the way, we have a really interesting time because we're just learning all the time and often being nudged to kind of change any preconceptions we have. We kind of always learning, as are, I think, the people around us. To encapsulate the kind of work we do on Wednesday of this week, we spent the day on Clee Liberty Common in the Shropshire Hills area. In the morning, we were with a butterfly and moth specialist getting really involved in the micro detail of a landscape. And we saw a green hair streak butterfly for the first time. We were told what to look for, and us and six other people We're looking in the gorse bushes on a windy and quite cold day, but we saw this little cluster of these green hair streak butterflies. Then in the afternoon, we went to meet the grazier who grazes on the common, and he took us on a three-hour quad bike tour of the whole common, looking at the views out across the Shropshire Hills into Wales. So we went from the micro to the macro landscape in, in the space of a few hours, and it was incredible getting the the opinions, the values, the the different attachments to place from two different experts in that place in the same day it just felt like a real privilege if you like to be there blew our minds a little bit i must admit and then jiggling around in the in a crate on the back of a quad bike for three hours both both, both (laughs) our legs were a bit bruised but it was was such a fantastic day yes in fact that day they also announced how the british some of the british butterfly species are now on the red list because I thought about you, and we talk about experts and models and stuff, but how we know this is by citizens going around looking for these things and not finding them and reporting them. Citizen science, isn't it? It's called. So anybody can get involved. I'm just Googling <laughs> green hair streak butterfly. And it's really cute, and I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah, it's really bright green, like emerald, and it only lives on gorse. And in this particular common, it's never been monitored before. So this is a really useful project and they're going to monitor it for three years and see what they find out. And we were told that with climate change, a lot of butterflies and moths are having to move uphill. And so these upland commons are really important habitats for many species. And it's, it's just exciting to be part of it and to talk to people who are really passionate about it. And then to talk to, to the grazier, the commoner on that land, who, who puts his sheep on that land and inform him about what we'd seen that morning. He knew we were going along to it, but it's about joining up the dots. You know, it's about your podcast title effectively, about how you make those connections to more information, to better colour up a space for anybody, everybody. And I think that's crucial, really. Joining up those dots is the key to moving forward. So more information actually making life, making work a lot easier rather than complicating life. Cool. Is there anything else you wanted to say? So, yeah, we've been talking a lot about curlews and also the way that Rob and I are really lucky to learn from people who are monitoring what's happening in the natural world. And we had very close connection with some curlews and witnessed the loss of eggs. So we had a lot of hope and then our hopes were dashed. And there is good work going on, but it's it's a bit touch and go at the minute. But this is a short poem I wrote off the back of that as part of the Sense of Here project. And it's called Shifting Baselines. The remarkable curlew should not be remarkable. Its arrival each spring is the tail end of plenty flying dangerously close to the fading space of memory, somewhere between here and gone. 
it does always make me cry. Sorry. <laughs> we need to know these things. We need to know the value of loss, not just about value of having. Yeah, on, on that note, I think even in these parlous times, you can't look away. You shouldn't look away. You need to witness these things, to bear witness to them, even if they're even if they're disappearing. And I know it, it feels a bit like a, a passenger, really, in this fast jet that's hurtling past as, as things seem to be going the wrong way, in the wrong direction. But I think the more people who can stand up and look and, and witness these things and, and, and quietly shout about it, the, the greater help it will be. Apathy is one of the biggest dangers in this world, I'm afraid. And the less people who are concerned or the less people who share their concerns, I think the, the easier it will be for things to just slide by. What the hell is the worth of a curly? Why does it matter, a curly? Mm. Um, or newt. But or- apathy and distraction. We're very good at distracting ourselves and that's that time issue again. You keep yourself busy, you don't need to think about the tough stuff. But the tough stuff's there. But we should really finish on some kind of happy <laughs> um, I was just going to say it's to do what you can, I think, is really important. Whatever circle you're in, whatever place you're at, whatever job you do, whatever value system you have, do what you can. Don't beat yourself up for the things that you can't do because we can all make choices. We can all make decisions. We've talked about time a fair bit in this while we're chatting to you. And time is a limited resource but we all have choices about how we use that time and what we do with it and as Harriet said about pausing just being still is still a very good use of time I think people today aren't aren't used to being bored you know you've always got some form of distraction right in your hands all the time and I think to to let loose of that occasionally to actually step out into the wide world and that could be on your doorstep in a city as well as in the countryside I think to to invest a bit of time in that place to soak it up and understand what's there as well. You know, pick up a little book on flowers or birds or moths and butterflies. The more you understand about what's happening in your doorstep, the more you appreciate what it is. You'll start making those connections that we all need and we all value. I, I think as a society, globally almost, we've become too detached from the natural world. And I think if we can rein back a bit of that space uh, then I think that'd be really, really helpful. We we get a lot from it personally, and I know that others would do too if they could choose to do that. If I may add from my own work is that I, when you said, let's not leave on a sad place, Harriet, I think it is possible to turn that into energy to do some things differently, like not not be sad about this and forget it and try and forget it <laughs> and move on and carry on with business as usual, but actually say, I don't want to be sad about this. I don't want this situation to happen. So what can I do to change it? And I've become more rebellious as rebellious as, as I can be, but like, you know, saying actually, no, we don't need any more evidence on this. We we know and it's the action that links that that needs to happen now. And we have to do that. It's it's not just duty. You know, if I don't want to be sad, I want I need to do that to remove the causes of sadness rather than ignore the feeling, right? No, that that really agree with you, Eche. It's you need to harness that's the data of the heart again, harness the power of emotions. And if you feel sad, what do you do about it? You you take action. And it's the same with anger. You might feel angry and it's it's not enough just to shout. Anger is also fuel for action. And that's, that's that installation that we did in the woods around HS2 deliberately used the color yellow, which is associated with the chakra in the center of your body where your kind of gut anger just comes from. And it's tapping into that and say, okay, yeah, we're really angry. We're sad. What can we do? But you can bet your bottom dollar just because you're angry, you're sad, you're not alone. There'd be a lot of other people who are angry and sad at the same thing or the same statistics or the same facts. So by mobilising, joining communities of like-minded people, that's how change happens, I think. It doesn't happen from one place with one person. It always happens by people coalescing together. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, read Rebecca Solnit's work. I think the, her work is is fantastic in this enabling hope to flourish and, and create a space for action to take place. So I think, Harriet, we have achieved what you wanted to do because 
finding a way from anger and sadness to action and making change and doing this with other people in the community, whatever is whatever our community is and whatever action we want to take is empowering. And I, for one, have, have had a massive emotional journey <laughs> talking with you today, but I am leaving it feeling much better than I started. So thank you very much. And I hope our listeners will share in as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eche. We really enjoyed it. Thanks, Eche. Really nice to talk to you. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the rest of the team, Neil McCune and Anna Gunn. You can find more information about this and other episodes on our website, jointhedotspodcast.com. And we'd love to hear from you on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. <laughs>